Hello everyone, my name is Brant Kudrowski and this Organic Chemistry Lab video covers an organic spectra interpretation experiment. This is part one, Introduction and Spectra Tables. This experiment assumes that you have at least some prior knowledge of NMR spectroscopy, IR spectroscopy, and mass spectrometry from your lecture course or from other videos. It'll focus on putting all of these different aspects together and solving unknowns with multiple spectra. In this experiment, you'll solve the structures of several unknowns labeled A through H. You'll be given a mass spectrum, an IR spectrum, a proton NMR spectrum, and a carbon-13 NMR spectrum for each unknown. You'll also be given tables of spectral data that you can use to help assign the peaks. As you assign the peaks, you'll learn about different parts of the molecules, little pieces of the structure. We'll call those fragments. Then you'll need to put those pieces together, assemble those fragments to provide a structure for the unknown that's consistent with all the data that you have. This is a bit like puzzle solving. You have to first get the pieces and then you put the pieces together to form the full picture of the molecule. We'll be going through unknown A in this video and solving it as an example. And then I'll also be going through unknowns B through H to give you hints on each one, but you'll ultimately be solving these on your own. Learning objectives for this experiment include developing practice interpreting mass spectra, IR spectra, proton NMR spectra, and carbon-13 spectra. You'll use tables of spectral data to identify molecular fragments from spectra of unknowns. You'll practice putting these fragments together to assign the structure of an unknown molecule. And you'll also learn to report spectral information in the proper format that we've asked you to include for infrared data, IR data, NMR data, and mass spectrometry data. Before we get into the unknowns, I want to go through some of the reference materials that you'll be given and should look at as you're going through and solving these unknowns. The first is a table of characteristic proton NMR chemical shifts. This is something I've made up for you to use. This table lists a variety of different protons in different kinds of chemical environments and the kind of chemical shift that they typically have. The first three entries show the typical location of alkyl groups that aren't near any deshielding group. A deshielding group might be an electronegative element or a multiple bond. Isolated alkyl groups tend to show up in this region. Methyls tend to show up at 0.9 part per million. CH2 groups, 1.3 part per million, and methine type protons, CHs, at about 1.7. When protons are near a double bond, they're deshielded somewhat by it, and they get pushed to slightly higher chemical shifts. 1.5 to 2.5 parts per million is typical for these protons. Protons that are attached to a carbon-carbon triple bond tend to show up at about 2.5 parts per million. Protons that are attached to a carbon that is attached to an electronegative element like a nitrogen, an oxygen, or a halogen tend to show up even a little further downfield at 2.5 to 4.0 part per million. The extent of the chemical shift depends on the electronegativity of the element. The protons in the right table are even further downfield because they're attached to sp2 hybridized carbons. The top two entries in the right table are protons that are directly attached to a carbon-carbon double bond. In an alkene, the chemical shifts are about 4.5 to 6.5 parts per million, and for benzene rings, the protons tend to be 6.5 to 8.5 part per million. Protons attached to the carbonyl group of an aldehyde are even further downfield at 9 to 10 part per million. And protons of carboxylic acids are extremely downfield with chemical shifts of between 10 and 14 parts per million. These peaks are often also very broad. Finally, there are the protons that are attached to alcohol, oxygen, and amine nitrogen. These tend to be broad and also quite variable in chemical shift due to the fact that they're often engaged in hydrogen bonding. 1 to 5 parts per million is common for these kinds of protons. There are two more points I want to make about proton chemical shifts. The first is that deshielding effects are additive. For example, protons on a carbon attached to one electronegative element, one chlorine for example, have a chemical shift of 3.05, which you could pick out of the table. If we add another electron withdrawing chlorine atom, the chemical shift is increased further to 5.30 parts per million, and adding a third chlorine increases it further to 7.24 parts per million. Neither of these values are in the table, and in fact, 7.24 looks like it could be a benzene ring type proton. However, it's the additive effects of three chlorines that put it in the same range. The next point about chemical shift I want to make is that deshielding effects decrease over distance. For example, in the following molecule we have a chlorine attached to an alkyl group. In the first CH2 of the alkyl group, the protons show up at 3.5 parts per million. They feel the effect of the chlorine very strongly. The next CH2 group is further away from the chlorine and feels the effect of it less strongly, showing up at a chemical shift of 1.8 part per million. Moving further away from the chlorine, the chemical shift of the following CH2 is 1.3 parts per million, which basically is the same as an ordinary CH2 group. The chlorine has minimal effect at this point, and further away from the chlorine, there's even less effect. Next, I'll go over a table of carbon-13 NMR chemical shifts. 
carbon NMR gives signals for carbon atoms, and carbons in different chemical environments have different chemical shifts. Carbon-13 chemical shifts are influenced by the same factors that influence proton NMR chemical shifts. The presence of electronegative elements are deshielding. The presence of nearby double bonds are deshielding. Carbons that are part of a double bond are more deshielded yet, and so on. Carbon NMR chemical shifts are influenced heavily by the hybridization of the carbon, and these three tables are broken down by carbon hybridization. The first group are the sp3 hybridized carbons, which tend to show up at the right side of the spectrum, the low chemical shift end of the spectrum. Carbons of alkyl groups that are far away from a deshielding group are 5 to 50 parts per million, while carbons that are directly attached to an electronegative element tend to be deshielded and push to higher chemical shifts at 25 to 80 parts per million. The carbons of triple bonds tend to show up at 65 to 100 parts per million. These are sp hybridized carbons. And then we have the sp2 hybridized carbon types. Carbons of alkenes tend to show up at 100 to 140 parts per million. Carbons in aromatic rings, in benzene rings, tend to show up at 120 to 160 parts per million. The carbons of carbonyl groups are even further downfield. They're shifted to much higher chemical shifts. Esters and carboxylic acids are in the 160 to 180 region, while the carbons of aldehydes and ketones are the most deshielded and show up typically between 200 and 220 parts per million. Keep in mind that these chemical shift ranges are approximate and that certain carbons can stray out of these ranges from time to time. Just like in proton NMR, deshielding effects in carbon NMR are additive. For example, an sp3 hybridized carbon with one chlorine attached shows up at 25 parts per million. When two chlorines are attached, it's shifted to 54 parts per million, and with three chlorines, it's shifted even further to 78 parts per million. As another example, take a look at the chemical shift of benzene. It's about 128 parts per million. Now look at what happens if we put an electronegative oxygen atom on that carbon. It shifts it to 155 parts per million. That's a move to higher chemical shift based on the electron withdrawing properties of the oxygen. Now we'll talk about some infrared absorption frequencies for common functional groups. Here's a big table that shows a whole bunch of different functional groups and where their peaks typically show up. IR peak frequencies are typically described in units of inverse centimeters, which is a frequency measurement. This is also called wave numbers. The table mostly focuses on peaks that appear in the functional group region of the spectrum. That's the area from 1500 wave numbers to 4000 wave numbers. The fingerprint region of the spectrum is very busy and it's usually difficult to pick out individual peaks there. However, sometimes you can pick out a CO bond because they're particularly strong, and so I've listed a few of those. I won't go through the entire table, but I will point out a few things. CH bond absorptions show up at locations that depend on the hybridization of the carbon they're attached to. SP3 hybridized carbon to H bonds show up at frequencies slightly lower than 3000 wave numbers. SP2 hybridized carbon H bonds show up at frequencies slightly higher than 3000. And SP hybridized carbon H bonds show up even higher at about 3300 wave numbers. Aromatic rings often show a pair of peaks at 1500 and 1600 wave numbers, and you may see one or both of these, whereas alkene carbon-carbon double bonds typically show a peak around 1650 wave numbers. Carbon-carbon triple bonds and carbon-nitrogen triple bonds show up at a distinctive position in the spectrum at about 2250 wave numbers. In addition to the frequencies of peaks here, I've also shown typical strengths of peaks. This would be medium, strong, or very strong. This indicates the typical size of a peak. I've also listed some details about peak morphology in some cases. You'll see some of these that are listed as broad and smooth, broad with spikes, very broad and jagged. These details can be useful for distinguishing NH and OH groups of different types. Next, I'm going to talk about carbonyl absorptions. That's the C double bond O. This is one of the most distinctive bonds in IR spectra. It's very strong due to its large dipole moment. The CO bond for aldehydes, ketones, and carboxylic acids tend to show up at about 1710 wave numbers. However, esters are distinctive. They show up at a little bit higher frequency, 1740, so you can distinguish an ester from the other carbonyl types by frequency. Aldehydes can be distinguished by their carbonyl H bond, which is distinctive and shows a pair of peaks at 2720 and 2820. Carboxylic acids have a very distinctive OH group, which shows up between 2300 and 3600. It's so broad and jagged, it takes up almost the whole left side of the spectrum, so it's very easy to tell a carboxylic acid from the other carbonyl types. Carbonyl groups often show a weak overtone peak. That's a peak that shows up at twice the fundamental frequency. So, for example, if you had a carbonyl peak at 1710, you might expect to see an overtone peak at 3420 twice the fundamental frequency. They typically are weak, 
but they oftentimes show up and they're in a region of the spectrum that could be confused with an OH group, an NH group, or a CH group of the SP hybridized type. So it's important to not be confused by these overtone peaks. Another important property of the carbonyl group is that its frequency is lowered by conjugation. A carbonyl group is conjugated if there's another pi bond bound to it. Here's an example of a non-conjugated carbonyl and a conjugated carbonyl. The difference here is the double bond that's present in the conjugated species. Conjugated C double bondos are a little weaker than non-conjugated C double bondos, and this lowers the frequency of the conjugated C double bondo. We'll talk about why in another video at another time. The last table I'll share with you are some common mass fragments and mass spectrometry. The peaks in a mass spectrum tell you something about the fragments in a molecule. The peaks come from cations that are formed in the mass spectrometer and can either represent the entire molecule, which is just lost an electron, that's called the molecular ion, or they can represent smaller fragments that form when that molecular ion breaks into smaller pieces. These are a list of fragments that are common in mass spectrometry that result from the fragmentation of a molecular ion. Peaks at 29 can come from an ethyl cation or can come from a formillium cation. They both weigh 29. A peak at 43 can be a propyl group, either a normal propyl group or an isopropyl group. Can also be an acylium ion, which is shown here. Peaks at 57 can result from butyl cations, and there's four different types. A normal butyl cation, a secondary butyl cation, an isobutyl cation, or a tertiary butyl cation. It might also be this larger acylium ion. These all weigh 57, and if you see a peak at 57, it could be any one of these species. Peaks at 77 typically are phenyl cations. A peak at 91 is oftentimes a benzyl cation. And a peak at 105 is typically this benzylium cation. You'll see many peaks in a mass spectrum, and some are more important than others. The important ones to get are the biggest peak, that would be the base peak, and the molecular ion, which is the heaviest substantial peak. The molecular ion region might also tell you what kinds of isotopes are present in a molecule. For example, you're likely to see a small M plus 1 peak due to carbon-13 incorporation. You might see a very large M plus 2 peak, and that would indicate either chlorine or bromine, depending on whether that M plus 2 peak is one-third the intensity of the molecular ion, or whether it's equal intensity. These are all things we'll go through through the course of the experiment. In the next video, I'll go through an example where you're given an IR spectrum, a mass spectrum, a proton NMR spectrum, and a carbon NMR spectrum, and we'll go through solving that unknown using the tables that we discussed in this video. If you found this video useful, check out the next one in the series or watch the prior video, and consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. My name is Brant Kudrowski. Thanks for watching.